Hello BookTube! As I've mentioned in a few videos today, we here on BookTube love our events. <laughs> we love readathons and read-alongs and reading sprints and themed months of all kinds. I am a host for one of those in the month of May. May is swarmed with them. I'm one of the hosts for, uh, May, uh, for Horror Mayhem, put on by the Bookish Bryants and celebrating horror fiction. Uh, and we have all sorts of prompts, and it's going to be a lot of fun reading horror fiction. It's, I'm going to learn a lot in the course of the month. It's one of the genres of fiction uh, that I've never really liked all that much. Uh, I And maybe some of that, in fact, I would think of, it's almost certain that a lot of that is ignorance, so I'd be glad to learn more. But there are a lot of other events as well, a huge number of events. And uh, as I mentioned in other videos, Leslie at the Nerdy, the Nerdy Narrative has a tentative anyway list of May events, a long list that you can look through and sort of pick from a la carte, depending on what you're interested in for the month of May. You could try to do them all. That would be fun. For somebody to try to do all of them at once, I imagine that the prompts in all of these events have a good deal of overlap. It might be possible to do them all for the month of May. I think you wouldn't survive. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I've gone down that list and picked just a few that I wanted to second and draw your attention to because I'm going to be doing them. Uh, I'm not invited to do any of these things, but uh, but I'm going to I'm going to be doing them anyway uh, because so, they sound like so much fun. And the one that I want to do for this video is, uh, I'm looking at the iPad over here so I don't get the details wrong, but I've also got the iPad Mini to show you covers, so you're not just staring at me or Frida the whole time. The, the one that I want to talk about in this video is by Margaret Pinard, and it is uh, May of the Moderns. Some of you may remember this once was March of the Moderns, but March is pretty full of events, so Margaret moved it to May, which is also pretty full of events. And it deals with... Uh, books published from 1901 to 1945, which is fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. Margaret says in her announcement video, I'll leave a link to her announcement video, she says in her announcement video that what she wanted, what she envisioned, was jumping in on books once Queen Victoria has finally dropped off the twig. Once she's finally exited stage left, then what? Then what? You've got that whole period in the first half of the 20th century. Second half of the 20th century, you know, that's a lot of that is taught in schools. A lot of that is known. A lot of those authors have been sort of colonized as favorites by a whole bunch of people, including a whole bunch of people on BookTube. But the first half really deserves an event. It deserves this concentration. Of course, part of the first half, part of those years, the beginning years, the first decade of the span that we're covering for this event, is my beloved Edwardian era. <laughs> but there are all sorts of other things as well. You've got two world wars in there. Uh, so the goal for for uh, May of the Moderns is to pick some books set in that time and read them. And I'm pretty sure that Margaret would agree that if you do that, regardless of the prompts, then you have participated and we hope you enjoy it. She hopes you enjoy it. Uh, I can guarantee, I can certainly guarantee, there's a lot of great reading stuff out there in those 40 years. Uh, and But there are prompts in case you like them to organize your events. I usually do. Uh, I have to admit, uh, for this year, for this, for this event, the prompts are a little confusing to me. They seem to be organized around grievance politics instead of celebrating <laughs> the, the events, the, the literature of the period. They seem to be drawing your attention to all the things that the cishet white men from 1901 to 1945 were doing wrong. Uh, and by easy implication, maybe insinuate that anybody who participates in this event is morally superior to all the cishet white men who lived during those 40 years. I can guarantee you that's not true. <laughs> but but maybe I'm reading it wrong. It just seems odd that you would settle on, on such potentially negative things instead of the genius that was bursting out all over in this period. But you can still get at the genius because the books are still full of it, and the prompts will lead you there. So, And maybe you won't see what I'm seeing anyway, maybe it's just me. The first prompt is Sex, a book that deals with the changing attitudes towards sex in this period, uh, which started out, you know, with uh, women's rights and uh, extending the franchise, and moved on from there. Uh, it's not a thing that any of us is comfortable admitting, uh, but wars the two world wars, especially the second world war, uh, that's covered in this time period did an enormous amount. The men were suddenly gone. Their jobs still had to be done. Women started entering the workforce and showing that they could do the jobs just as well as the men or better. Uh, all over the workforce, that changed a lot. Uh, that changed a lot, not just in terms of society, 
right? Where you have, uh, what? A construction business in Kansas City. And suddenly, you know, you're 65, you own the business, but your sons are all drafted. They're all gone to war. Well, you've got daughters, and it turns out they can drive a truck. It turns out they can they can haggle over a contract. It turns out they can operate a cement mixer. It turns out they can do all of that. Not only did society see that, uh, but women saw it themselves. Women who had been maybe raised in cloistered sexual attitudes suddenly saw their friends from school or, uh, you know, or from church or wherever talking about earning a paycheck of their own, talking about the satisfaction of having a job out in the world. It did a lot. That war changed a lot. And so, so you have in this period, these 40 years, drastic upheavals in traditional ideas about, about sex and all of that, the roles of sex in society and whatnot. I picked, uh, there are all sorts of serious things that you could read on this subject. I picked something that sort of isn't, but it definitely shows. It's definitely there. It's definitely affected by that. This is Dorothy Sayers, the great Dorothy Sayers. And this is a Lord Peter Whimsey mystery of hers called Strong Poison, which came out in this period. Uh, and which is the, it's a, it's a really terrific story. It doesn't, it doesn't rely a lot on the heavy-handed gimmicks that this author sometimes hauls out of nowhere in the third act. Uh, but more important than that, and connected with this prompt, is that this introduces Harriet Vane, the character of Harriet Vane, uh, who is very much Dorothy Sayers' way of addressing the, the changing attitudes towards sex. Very much. Not we're not, we're not. I'm not talking here when we mention sex. I'm talking about the whole ball of wax. I'm not talking just about you know Saturday afternoon hoo ha. <laughs> I'm talking about the whole ball of wax, as I think this prompt is meaning the attitude of the sexes, the attitude of of men and women in society. This is that is this is. I don't mean to give the wrong impression. This is not a cosy novel at all. But Harriet Vane changes things. When she shows up, she changes things. Not just because eventually she turned out to be incredibly popular with Dorothy Sayers' readership, but also because, again, this is not a preachy novel at all. It's tremendously enjoyable, but there is no way for the comfortable, padded leather boys' club attitude of Peter Whimsey's own world to remain exactly the same once Harriet Vane is in that world. There's no way for that to happen, uh, and it doesn't happen. It's very intriguing to watch as she gets more prominent as the books go on. Uh, so that's what I'm going to read for sex. The next prompt is timeless, and it is a black classic that discusses race and class in ways that are still relevant in today's modern world. Uh, <laughs> uh, that prompt takes a lot of rhetorical turns that, that I just want to pump the brakes at every step of the way. I just, at every step of the way. I, I'm not going to, I made a point to tell myself that I'm not going to interrogate the prompts here too strictly. And I'm not going to rant or lecture. I merely want to point out that, that uh, when it comes to black classics and race and class in ways that are still relevant today, I want to point out things have changed. And if, if, you ha are thinking that nothing is different in race relations in America in 2022 than was true in 1902, you need to get off social media. <laughs> but nevertheless, a huge burgeoning of writing along these lines happened in these years. Of course, the Harlem Renaissance happened in these years. That was the first thing I thought of. And when I thought of that, I thought of uh, Alan Locke, uh, who was the subject of a fantastic biography just a few years ago a fantastic big biography called The New Negro, uh, which was, of course, the, the, a, a term that he coined. Uh, I loved that biography. I sang its praises from the rooftops. I still don't know to this day. I've never seen a paperback of it. I don't know if I'm even blurbed on the paperback. I think it was my favorite biography that year. Uh, just beautifully, wonderfully done. Uh, and Penguin Classics recently got in on the action. They have a new volume called The New Negro Aesthetic and Selected Writings uh, with an introduction and notes by the author of that biography. Uh, and it's, it gives you the one thing that that biography couldn't, which was, is Alan Locke's own writing. He's a fantastic writer and was in many ways uh, the grandfather of the, of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, and this is, part, pardon the double exposure, you've got two different beans here. That is the book with the bean. <laughs> uh, uh, that is the Penguin Classic. This is another, I'm going to Penguin Classics a lot with a lot of my answers here, including the next one. Uh, because the next prompt here, the next prompt is war. Uh, and that is a book slash novel slash memoirs or poems 
written by an author who actually fought as a soldier during the war. Uh, and that is, that is a fantastic prompt. Of course, you, you yourself know the cottage industry that has been made out of, for instance, World War I trench poets. <laughs> but Margaret, bless her, uh, makes the essential qualifying point in her announcement video uh, that when it comes to shells bursting in the air, when it comes to trench warfare, when it comes to being a five-minute march from the enemy who wants to kill you and doesn't care who you are, there's a little bit of a gray area when it comes to, what was it again? Uh, actually fought as a soldier during the war. It took a huge amount of courage to be a frontline nurse. A huge amount of courage. A huge amount more and different kind of courage than the men who had to run into no man's land. It took a lot more courage in some ways to be that kind of a nurse than it, than it took to be that kind of an enlisted grunt. Not least because the enlisted grunts on both sides knew that their officers would shoot them if they didn't. If you're under the impression that there was no such edict on the Allies' side, you're mistaken. <laughs> it wasn't just the Germans who knew that. It, 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 the nurses didn't hear anything like that. The nurses had to go and wipe, you know, brain splatter and intestines off their boots and keep working totally voluntarily. So that's a very, very good point. Nevertheless, for war, I am still going to go to a, uh, a soldier. Uh, because this is, this is a Penguin Classic, this is a Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition that I got and did not reread when I got it. And I, I, I love the book. The book is, it's ham-handed and a little bit disjointed, but it's extremely powerful. It's this, it's Storms of Steel. A Storm of Steel by Ernst Jünger. And this is the Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition. I had, I read this the last time, the time before that I read this, I read it in just a normal Penguin Classic. Uh, but they made a, a beautiful, uh, uh, Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition here, and I have it. I never cracked it to read, so I'll be reading this. I might have an ebook of this as well. Uh, I might read the ebook, if, uh, but I, I will. I will see. If I don't, I will read my Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition. Uh, then the next prompt here is End of Empire. <laughs> you see what I mean, right? We're not talking about uh, liberty here, or justice, or abolition, or uh, equal rights or anything or anything health and health advances or anything like that instead we're we're largely reflecting on the fact that the cishet white men between 1901 and 1945 were all sexist racist xenophobic imperialistic warmongers <laughs> they weren't <laughs> but nevertheless that's the kind of the impression i was getting but th this prompt is a book set in a place that was an imperial possession at this time or by an author from a place that was really really good of course, it was during these years that the biggest empire in the history of the world reached its biggest size. So it's a totally valid point. And the book that I'm going to pick is, again, it's a Penguin Classic. It's a reissue from Penguin. I got it in the mail, and you'd think I wouldn't need any inducement to reread this. I love it. I love this author. Uh, I'm going to read it again. I know that this is... I did the same thing with Maybe Midrash this year. I Maybe Midrash is another May event. And I did the same thing with Maybe Midrash that I'm doing with May of the Moderns. Some of my, my choices here, most of them, are very timid. And I realize that. I realize they're very safe. I, the, the, one of the great things about these reading events, uh, the Moderns event especially, is how it encourages you to explore. Go out and read something that you've never read before. Don't go back to your old favorites. There's a, an ocean of stuff out there. And I know that. And I'm on that sense, I'm letting the side down. But I'm still going back to this because I have the new Penguin Classic. All that's new about it is an introduction. But it, still, it's Passage to India, which I really, there really isn't a cause for me to read this again. Uh, but I will. <laughs> I absolutely will take it up. So, and I have this volume from Penguin, so I will be, I will be doing that. Uh, and then the final prompt is The Other. Uh, this is the xenophobic prompt. This is a book translated from another language. Uh, and I have a, an, an example here that I have not read in a long time. I've read this author, but not this book. Uh, and it's Some Prefer Nettles by Tanizaki. All of these books came out in the, the time frame that we're talking about here. Uh, this is a lovely uh, vintage paperback edition with the cover there, but uh, I don't know if this is the, the cover of the ebook that I have. I don't even know if I, right off the top of my head, if I have an ebook, but. Uh, I'm going to check with all of these to see that I have ebooks first, uh, but I will. I haven't read some of her nettles in quite some time, uh, so it's it's high time that I did. I don't I, again. The, the one of the ways that certainly 
the publishing industry could improve over the benighted days of 1901 to 1945 would be to finally get around to putting the translator's names on the cover of the book. You wouldn't be reading this thing if it weren't for the translator. And the whole experience of what you'll be experiencing when you do read this thing is in the hands of the translator. It might be nice if the translator's name was on the cover. I don't know off the top of my head who translated this. Uh, but uh, I'm going to try it anyway. If I don't have an ebook, I'll then I must have a physical copy of Some for a Nettle somewhere. Uh, so that's it. Those are my suggestions for May of the Moderns. And I'm naturally curious, as with all of these announcement videos, what you plan to do. I'm hoping that you join in on this event. This is a time period that really needs your attention. Uh, a lot of a lot of deeply formative and important books of all kinds, fiction and nonfiction, that came out of these decades. Uh, so does this period interest you? Uh, are you going to join in on May of the Moderns? And if so, what are your answers to some of these prompts? I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear what you're going to be reading. And even if you're not going to do May of the Moderns, feel free in the comments section to tell me what May events, if any, on BookTube you are going to participate in, because you'll see on the, the video that I'm linking from The Nerdy Narrative how many there are. It's all types of books for May, so, so there's plenty to choose from. Uh, but anyway, th that's one that I'm going to do, is May of the Moderns. I love it. I'll be watching all of the, uh, the hashtag videos. There are, uh, when, you see, when you go to, to Margaret's video, you'll see she has spared no effort at all. This is a huge event with all the bells and whistles that she's doing. A lot of fun and guaranteed good reading. Uh, so, so there you go. Anyway, there you go. That is, that is my May of the Moderns. Uh, I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.